you have a session titled Ensuring a Performant Web for the Next Billion People. Mm -hmm. How will the next billion people differ from existing web users? The next billion people online are going to be from emerging economies. So, number one, they're going to be on smartphones rather than coming on a desktop or a laptop. But also, those smartphones are likely to be lower spec devices than probably you're using and I'm using. You know, they're not. Uh, top-notch Android or iOS devices, their $100 Android devices or Nokias. And also they're in uh, territories such as India with big mountain ranges like the Himalayas or Indonesia which is spread across a thousand islands where the networks are just not as fast as ours for reasons that they are just generally slower and of course the challenges of that sort of terrain and geography makes getting a fast network a lot harder. So they tend to be using lower spec devices, slower networks, so a lot of them are using proxy browsers and a product that my employers make, Opera Mini, is one of those other proxy browsers are available. So today I was really talking about how to make sure that your websites work well with proxy browsers while also, of course, looking great and having great functionality for full browsers. Right. So you answered this a little bit before, but the types of devices that they're going to use. Mm -hmm. The limitations on those devices will be primarily speed, access, that kind of thing? It'll be speed because they'll have uh, lower spec CPUs. It'll be uh, memory. They'll have less RAM to store stuff in. And they'll have just generally less storage space. So we know, for example, that the average smartphone user has 36 apps on her device. One in four are used every day like gaming, social media, and one in four are never used at all. But that's nine apps that are never used. And if each one is 10 or 15 megabytes, that's taking up a, a lot of space. So one of the things that I've been doing on behalf of my employers, but in the wider web standards community, most notably with uh, Google and Mozilla, is standardizing a, a thing called installable web apps. And this is web apps that are hosted on the web. Mm -hmm. You might know these as sites. Um, but instead, <laughs> of book, yeah, <laughs> instead of bookmarking them in the browser, which is kind of, a lot of people don't know where the bookmarking yeah. functionality is, you can bookmark a web app and it saves the app's icon onto the home screen. Then the user taps the icon, the site opens, but full screen with no browser Chrome. So it's indistinguishable mm -hmm. in many ways, look and feel from a native app. But because it's hosted on the website, it's not taking up storage space on the device. Right. And also because, because it's on the website, the moment you make a change, anybody who presses that icon right. sees the new version. Because if you have a native app, uh, you know Google Play, etc., are very good at telling you there's a new version. But people in emerging economies aren't necessarily on Wi-Fi all the time. There could be, a, you know, a week's worth of lag between you're releasing your new native app yep. and people actually downloading and using it. Installable web apps are instantaneous, so it's it's better for better for business owners too. That's interesting. There is sort of a luxury in being able to update your apps whenever you want, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, those of us who do a lot of traveling, I've uh, shamefacedly gone to my boss with large expense claims because I've been updating apps over roaming. Update all. Yeah, yes. yeah. You've got to watch out for that one. Um, how can developers ensure that the web experiences that they're building are actually accessible to everyone everywhere? I mean, is that an aspirational thing or is it actually possible? It's not only possible, it's built in to the, to the fabric of the web. I mean, the way Tim Berners-Lee uh, initially designed the web was that you have a layer called HTML, which is your content, and then you style that with CSS, and if a browser can't deal with that bit of CSS, it just silently fails and continues with the stuff it can deal with. Then you can add all kinds of interactivity with JavaScript, but you need to assume that the JavaScript won't run. And that's not just proxy browsers, that's corporate firewalls can stop uh, JavaScript, you can lose it mid-connection in a bad connection, even in, you know, even in San to Clara that can happen. So if you design your site that it will work the plain Jane HTML version, it might not be as slick, but it still works and the JavaScript is uh, an enhancement, 
then it's accessible to everybody. Uh, there's a fad at the moment for using things like React and Angular, and these send lots of JavaScript down to the client, and then the JavaScript is run on the device, and that does the job that the HTML did. But the trouble is with that is even if you're targeting smart devices, that device has the download of the JavaScript, has to decode it, which is taking up CPU, mm -hmm. and taking up CPU is using battery, and there's a lag. So if you just do it the traditional way, progressive enhancement, everybody benefits, not just people in Bangladesh or people using Opera Mini, but everybody will benefit. And this is this is a this is as old as the web, this methodology. So where is it going wrong? It's perceived by some people as hard to do. And I, I get that. I used to be uh, a traditional computer programmer writing in COBOL 4, Trans C++, where you know the environment that it's being run on. You can make lots of assumptions. And if you're coming to front-end programming from those environments, it's very difficult to get your mindset around the fact that you're, you have to basically make everything uh, fail-proof. And you can never understand the, uh, the the environment in which the customer's coming from, and from that, particularly if you work in the UK or you know the Bay Area where everybody's running an iPhone or a high-end Android device, everybody's got a fast network. It's very easy to fall into the trap of testing on the things that you and your friends use, right. and assuming that every customer across the world is using the same things. You know, and you, you never know where your customers are. There's a a tale I like to tell, but I didn't have time today. There was a business in New York called um, Igniter, and it was a dating agency for traditional Jewish families in the New York area. And the premise was that you wouldn't meet one to one, there'd be five guys, five girls, and they'd go together to the museum or the cinema. And they didn't get uh, enough traction to make this business really take off. And they were kind of thinking about closing it down. And they noticed they were suddenly getting as many sign-ups a week from India, Bangladesh, and Pakistan as they'd had in the US since launch. And it turned out that this model they had for more traditional Jewish families was equally applicable to more traditional Muslim, Hindu, and Sikh families. So they rebranded as Step Out, moved themselves to Mumbai, and became the biggest dating agency in India. Right. Even though, if you'd asked them who they're targeting, they would have said urban professionals in New York. You never know where your customers are going to come from. Interesting. So you've been involved with Web Standards since 2002? Since is that 2000. That's why I look like this. <laughs> <laughs> How have standards changed over that time? They're getting better. Yeah. And that's for two reasons. The pressure on us is to make them better faster because the, the rate of change is speeding up again. And they're getting more data-driven. So instead of you know great minds sitting in a room thinking, wouldn't it be cool if, and then inventing something that maybe developers didn't want, mm -hmm. we're actually, uh, this is ongoing at the moment, it's not complete, but we're actually looking at a way of getting developers' wishes and problems fed into our process, getting their feedback on early drafts, actually making running code and then tweaking it according to feedback. Not only to speed up the standardization process, but make sure that we expend our efforts standardizing the things that developers and businesses actually want, rather than things that we think the web needs. I was a developer until seven years ago with a big, big legal organization in the UK. But now I'm not a developer, I'm a guy who goes out to conferences. So I'm not best placed to understand what real developers in industry need to do. And neither are many of my colleagues across the different browsers as an organizations uh, who are involved in standards. So that's one of the great things we're doing. If anybody's interested, it's called the Extensible Web Manifesto. Stick it into your search engines of choice and uh, read it. It's a short document that explains how we're trying to make web standards more responsive to, to bring a better web. Over the next few years, how do you see things playing out between um, native apps and mobile apps or web apps? I think, and I take uh, my, my opinions quite hardcore on this, and this does not reflect the opinion of my employers. <laughs> uh, 
my my personal opinion is that native apps are a bridging technology like Flash was, like Silverlight, maybe even like Java and it's, they've done a great job in giving customers and businesses things that the web couldn't provide and they've given us in the web what we in England call a kick up the arse to actually up our game. Uh, you know, three years ago you wanted to access your location on your, visit, on your mobile, you had to use a native app. We standardise a geolocation API, and now every browser on every device can do that. We have video conferencing in the browser, we have drag and drop, we have uh, file inspection, we have accelerometers. Because of native apps, it's encouraged us to raise our game. But the vast majority of the world are not coming on high spec Android devices, they're not coming on iOS devices, they're coming on the web. And if you want those people, if you want five billion people who will live in rich Asian countries in 2050 buying your products. The web is the way that you'll talk to those people. Last question for you. What people or projects are you following these days? I'm following the Extensible Web Manifesto, I'm very interested in something called Service Worker, which is largely being driven by uh, friends of mine in Google, Samsung and Mozilla. And that's a method of making sure that web apps can work offline. Because native apps, you know, you have a native webmail client and it's a native thing. If you're not connected, obviously you can't send or receive emails, but you can draft them, you can delete old ones, you can organize. Web apps can't do that currently. If you're offline, you just get a blank screen with a message. Message. But service workers will bring the functionality I mentioned where you can do the curation, you can draft stuff, etc., even when you're offline. And that will significantly narrow the gap between native and uh, native and, and web. Other things I'm following, I'm, I'm personally very interested in not just making the web accessible to people in uh, emerging economies, but making the web accessible to people with disabilities. Um, so that's something I follow a lot and keep a close eye on. And I just try to follow as many real world developers from as far a geographical reach as I can on Twitter just to see what real people's uh, problems and obstacles are so I don't get caught up again in a standards browser western bubble. Great. Thank you for being with us. Thank you.